So today, a conversation about one of Australia's most exciting and most ambitious rewilding projects. My guest is Regional Ecologist for Australian Wildlife Conservancy in South Australia and Central Australia, Helen Crisp. Helen, thanks for joining us on AWC in Conversation. Thanks heaps, Joey, and hello to everybody that is listening in or going to listen in very soon. It's great to be here. Yeah, we've got a, a good turnout today. Um, so Helen, we'll, we'll dive right into it. Um, today we're talking about the rewilding work that's going on at our New Haven Sanctuary in Central Australia and some of the translocations that have happened there over the past couple of weeks and they're actually going on as we speak. But to start with, I'd like you to talk about the area that you work across. So you're actually speaking to us from another AWC sanctuary right now. Uh, where are you today? Yeah, that's right. So I live here at Yukamara Sanctuary. So this is a property in South Australia, um, a couple of hours northeast of Adelaide. So I live here with my husband, who's a sanctuary manager, and our nearly nine-year-old son, his birthday is tomorrow. So we've been at Yukamara for nearly seven years now, and it's been a beautiful place to live and work. And yeah, so now um, in this regional ecologist role that I've been in for just over a year, um, I'm so fortunate to, my, my role covers seven properties now. So all of our properties in South Australia and also two properties in the Northern Territory, one of those being New Haven. Right, so that's a very big area to be working across. Um, where you're based at Yukamara is also a fenced sanctuary, um, but the scale that we're working on in Central Australia is a step up from that, isn't it? Um, what was it's it like for you starting to work in that region? Yeah, look, it's slightly larger up there, Joey. So Yukamara's fenced area is 1,100 hectares and New Haven's fenced area is nearly 9,500 hectares. So a little bit different in terms of scale. Look, when I took on the role and knowing that New Haven and the reintroduction program was going to be part of the job, I was so excited. You know, it's such an amazing project. Um, it's ambitious, it's challenging. Um, just the scale of working in an, in the arid zone and, you know, of what we're trying to achieve. It is, it is a huge challenge, but um, I was pretty excited by that because it has such a good investment in reintroductions and threatened species mm. in the country. Yeah. So our, our supporters will be familiar with our work in this space, but if you haven't heard, AWC is a leading proponent of creating these fenced feral predator-free safe havens. So these are fenced areas completely free of feral predators where we're able to reintroduce some of the locally extinct mammal species. And we've got eight of these projects across Australia, another in construction at the moment in North Queensland, and on top of that, another reintroduction project to Foray Island in Shark Bay. So we really manage the largest network of these kind of feral predator free safe havens. And I guess, you know, the the rationale behind that is that Australia's lost a lot of its small to medium sized mammals in particular. So when we're talking about reintroductions, it really is focused on those mammals that have declined or completely disappeared from across their former range. In central Australia, it sits at the epicenter of those mammal extinctions. So there's a, probably about 15 or more native mammals missing from that central Australian landscape. People have talked about it as a marsupial ghost town. Um, so I guess what that means is in building one of these fenced safe havens in Central Australia, it's good bang for your buck. It means that there's a bunch of species that we're able to restore by creating one feral predator free safe haven. Like you mentioned, Helen, this one's nine and a half thousand hectares. Um, and I guess, you know, removing predators is part of it, but there's also the habitat management that goes on to support reintroductions. What are some of the other management um, programs that we've got in place to support this work? Yeah, definitely. So fire plays a really important role in Central Australia, particularly on our New Haven property. Um, so fire is something that obviously can be hugely devastating as most of us are aware, but if managed properly and if actually done at the right time, um, it's actually really beneficial to some of our um, plant communities, which in turn can actually benefit a lot of the species that we're reintroducing as well, uh, whether that's through 
um, availability of food resources and, and things like that. So the fire program at New Haven has been done exceptionally well over the past decade plus more. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a really important tool in what we do. Also, we do extensive um, feral cat and fox control across New Haven, so outside of the fence, obviously. Um, yeah, it's, it's really important, yeah. Yeah, the image I shared just before was of a, a prescribed burn that was put in just outside of the fenced area to create a barrier. So it's a bit of a, um, a fire break, I guess, breaking up the fuel load. There's a few different objectives for that work. One is obviously to, to limit the spread of hot, you know, intense, out of control wildfires. Um, they tend to happen over summer when it's hotter and drier. Um, but it's also managing the diversity of different age classes of grass, um, which is food for a lot of the, the mammals that we're reintroducing. So we do prescribed burns, not just outside of the safe haven, but also within it to create that mix of, of different vegetation. Okay, so we've got this, this big safe haven where looking at the list of species to reintroduce, um, people might have heard about the mala that was released there, I think starting in 2017, so about five years ago now, they're doing really well. We've had red-tailed fascigales released at New Haven a couple of years ago. What's the logic in the sequence of reintroductions and how did that inform the releases that have just happened over the last week or, or a couple of weeks? Yeah, so um, so the mala was a really interesting story in that it, that was a real emergency type situation. So the, the broader fenced area hadn't actually been completed. Um, well, it had been completed, but not feral free as yet. So we had to really pivot and, and put mala into a smaller sort of um, protected area that was free of cats and foxes, while that bigger area was um, being removed of cats and foxes. Um, so normally, it, it sometimes depends, sometimes that's opportunity, like what happened with the mala. And then with the red tail fasca gales, again, you know, it's really hard to work in isolation with these projects. So there was other work going on with red tail fasca gales. Um, so, you know, sometimes we need to link in with what others are doing and doing it. With the releases that we're currently doing with the burrowing betons and the bilbies, because they're burrowers and they're really important ecosystem engineers, Ideally, it would be, it's great to get them in first and then they can start moving the soil around, creating warrens, creating burrows that then other species can use. Not just other reintroduced species, but just other species that are extent there um, in the landscape from, you know, little reptiles and little geckos up to, you know, snakes and, you know, things like that. So, you know, the burrowers are great. We've we've sort of done a couple of other species because marla don't burrow. They don't dig a lot. They live in um, little nests under spinifex bushes. And red tail fasca gales, they live in hollows, but they also live in little shelters and nests on the ground. So now with the burrowers coming in, it's really exciting because it's also a, a really important piece of the puzzle, I guess, for that landscape. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I think you used the term there, ecosystem engineers. So both of these species, the burrowing betong and bilby, are animals which turn over a lot of soil. So that they're, they're active burrowers, like you said, they dig for their food as well. Um, I think an individual of either species can turn over about 20 tonnes of soil in a year. So really changing the soil dynamics quite dramatically. Um, so that's, that's fascinating to kind of introduce not just the species, but also those processes back into the landscape. Um, there's also evidence of burrowing betong warrens from before they went extinct in Central Australia. Um, is that does that play into the reintroduction? Yeah, absolutely. So with any reintroduction program, we look at what species used to be there. Um, so we're always at this point in time, we're always reintroducing animals into their previous um, distribution areas. Um, so with the burrowing betongs, it's an amazing story up at New Haven because there's actually relict warrens um, at New Haven where burrowing betongs used to live, you know, back in the day. So what we're actually finding now is that the burrowing betongs are reusing those old historical warrens and opening them up again and renovating them, which is, it's, you know, we were hoping that's what would happen, that 
that played a really important part in where we released burrowing betongs a couple of weeks ago. We wanted to really maximise them being near those old warrens and using them. And they're doing exactly what we thought. So that's really, really exciting. And it's such a, um, for Central Australia as well, it's, it's a really, um, the relict warrens are, you know, there's sort of that little snapshot of what it used to be like. And to be able to use that in the present day is amazing. I've got a little clip here that I hope you can see, which is from one of the releases. And this is a burrowing betong. It's, it's fitted with a, a tracking collar and we might talk through that in a minute. Um, but I think this clip shows it actually going back into one of the warrens, one of these historic warrens that are there from, you know, before these animals disappeared from Central Australia decades ago. You know, it's, it's probably at least 50 years. There it is, you can see, so under the calcrete, um, so the, the burrows that were made in sort of harder soil tend to be preserved better. Um, and, you know, it's, it's so exciting that after decades of these, these warrens being empty or, you know, at best used by rabbits, we've now got native animals sort of moving back home, moving back in. Lovely. Yeah, little, that's little really critters. cool. <laughs> yeah. They're um, so funny. Um, yeah, and we've actually, so the team on the ground, so we've got a, a team of four science staff that live and work at New Haven and also a team of um, up to four um, operation staff. So, you know, eight people that live and work at New Haven. And so the team have been um, radio tracking these animals that we've just released. And, you know, they're finding now relict warrens that they weren't actually sure, they weren't, you know, they weren't mapped previously, but they've been able to, find them after tracking some of the burrowing betongs. So that's really exciting as well. Isn't that so interesting and, and fantastic yeah. to see. So um, it was, what was it, three weeks ago now that I think that these um, most recent releases happened. There's more happening actually over the next couple of days, next 24 hours even. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm interested in the logistics of a translocation like that. So obviously there's a lot of planning um, can you talk about where these animals have come from? Because the, the source populations and the genetics are important considerations too. How does that work? And then what are the things that are that you need to check off basically in the lead up to one of these operations? Yeah, for sure. It's um it is a logistical exercise, that's for <laughs> sure. So I'll give you um so it, for the bilbies and for all, I guess all the threatened species that AWC work with, um, one of the most important things is that many of our staff sit on national recovery teams of these species. And by doing that, it gives us a really good understanding of how that species is going in general, but also how the different source populations are going. Um, so when it comes to planning a reintroduction, we can start talking to our stakeholders and start looking at where we could potentially source animals from. In terms of genetics, that forms a really important part as well. So with the bilbies, by way of an example, um, we've got bilbies across four other sites in AWC. So for New Haven, what we wanted to do was really um, establish a genetically different population that we were already protecting. And that was in line with the National Bilby Recovery plan as well and taking on advice from that that group of people um so because of that um so um i think what helen was saying is there's you know the existing populations which are in these safe havens around the country uh have their own genetic characteristics the goal at new haven was to add value basically by creating a genetically distinct population um that's part of the I guess population planning overall for bilbies. So it's, you know, it's not just looking at getting the number of bilbies up, but also making sure they're healthy, diverse populations for that species. That's absolutely correct, Joey. And so for that reason, you know, we decided to, um, the first lot of bilbies that came to New Haven a couple of weeks ago, we, our important source partners were with Taronga Western Plains Zoo. So we worked with them to get bilbies to New Haven. And as we speak, we've got traps that are being opened at Karawinia National Park, which is extremely exciting that that's happening over this weekend. So working with our source partners, we've been able to get and find um, populations of bilbies that are genetically different to what we're currently protecting and that will contribute to the national recovery of the bilby. 
Um, we also really hope over the next couple of years to try and supplement the bilbies at New Haven as well with wild genetics as well. Um, again, really sort of building a really resilient population. Mm -hmm. And a similar sort of thought process goes behind everything that we do. So with the burrowing betongs, it was really important that we got a good mix of different genetics. So because of that, we actually had um, three different source sites for the burrowing betongs. So we had Yukamara, Scotia, and also Matawa in Western Australia. And that was purely genetically driven as well, because by mixing those populations, we've been able to sort of start off with a really sort of diverse um, group of betongs as well. That's fantastic. And then when it comes to the actual operation, there's lots of people involved. So we deploy staff at every end of, of these, uh, these translocations. That means sometimes sending AWC ecologists to help resource with trapping bilbies at the source sites. And then at the New Haven end, that so they're, you know, set up in, um, sorry, packed up in pet packs. Um, and it, it usually all happens sort of within 24 hours, doesn't it? So that they're not, not handled for too long or not in captivity for too long. What was it like being at New Haven when that first plane landed? And I'm gonna share a photo here with uh, a couple of the Walpuri indigenous rangers that we work with. Um, so Alice Numpajimba Henwood and, and Lee, who is also a ranger in Central Australia. What was that like being there for that moment, Helen? Oh my gosh, Joey. So I guess for full disclosure, this was not my first translocation. I've been working in this space for around 15 years and I've actually lost count of the number of translocations I've been involved with. But this particular moment was really special. I actually almost cried about six different times during this translocation because I think, you know, it's it's such a long process to get those burrowing betongs um, that you're seeing there to New Haven. Um, I was telling this up the other day, there were 17 different approvals and permits that we needed to get because we we're working across four different states essentially, um, you know, and, you know, it was just such a process and it was just, it's so rewarding when you actually see the animals get to where you want them to go. But then there's also this element of, um, okay, great. Now the next step is making sure they establish and they, you know, do what we hope they will do. So it was really exciting. And it was, we had the whole team there. It was super special with the rangers. Um, I got to meet some of the rangers for the first time and it was, it was amazing. Another another special moment was when the Nirupi school um, joined us, and this is a, a little oh. clip with a lot of the students from the local school. Um, for many of whom, you know, it was probably the first time they'd seen a bilby, um, and the the local word, the Walpuri word for bilby, is minu, minu. So a lovely yeah. lovely name from the Walpuri language, which is is still used for that animal. Right. So yeah. they're back. So the the bilbies and betongs are there now at New New Haven. Already, um, we're detecting signs of digging and burrowing activity, like you said, back at the, the Betong Warrens. So that's a, a good sign that they're settling in. How do we sort of monitor that adjustment and their, their movements over these critical few weeks? Because I know that the first weeks after a translocation are the critical time when you're looking at survival. Yeah, that's right. So survivorship's really important with any translocation. Um, so to monitor survivorship, we use radio telemetry. So for burrowing betongs and most species, we use radio collars. Um, and we only radio collar a subset of the animals that we release. Um, so there's an example there. So that's um, one of the radio collars that we've put on burrowing betongs. Um, for bilbies though, because they're such ferocious diggers and the, when you see a bilby, it's got the really long snout. It doesn't have much of a neck. Um, collars aren't very good for bilbies so we actually use tail mounted transmitters and so we can still um, monitor them in the exact same way that we do with the burrowing betongs um, so we've got teams on the ground that are radio tracking um, handheld radio tracking but also what's really um, cool at New Haven is that we've got a system of telemetry towers so these are towers that are spaced out across the fenced area can't remember how many we have. I think there might be six or seven with a couple of trailers that are movable. And what those towers do is actually automatically log any animal that goes past there with a radio collar. So then 
cuts down a little bit of time in the field for the staff. They can go to these collars and, and look at what animals have been detected. And then if there's any missing, then they can just go and target them. So in terms of effective conservation, it's actually quite effective because um, then you're just sort of targeting those that are missing. Um, and also what the team are doing is, is sort of tracking those animals every day to where they're sheltering to get a really good understanding of what sort of bushes or ha habitats they might be digging in or, or moving around. So that's, that's a really important part of the first stage of a translocation or release. Yeah. 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 And those, you know, you mentioned towers and tripods. So these are different sorts of um, radio receiver mounts, I guess, which are scattered across that whole stage one area, um, nine and a half thousand hectares. Um, and, you know, it's another example of how technology is changing this kind of work. So more of that remote sensing, um, basically freeing up the time for our ecologists to be doing more valuable work rather than just going out and doing the, you know, that manual stuff of, of collecting data if technology can do it more quickly. Um, yeah. I know some, some of our supporters actually funded uh, the infrastructure related to these translocations and those radio towers at New Haven. So we're very grateful for that. Helen, um, it's been great to talk about these translocations. I'd like to just finish with um, zooming out a little bit to talk about this New Haven project and what it's going to look like in the future. So we've got this nine and a half thousand hectare area. I think with the betons and bilbies, that brings us to five species restored. Is that right? Um, and there's yeah, still, that's more, right. still more to go. Yeah, we're about halfway through the, the um, project. So um, the, I guess the the next species that's sort of on our list is the central rock rat, which is in close collaboration with the Northern Territory government. So as we speak, we have just had a bunch of cameras brought in from the field that has been um, looking at where central rock rats could be and potentially areas that we could harvest. Um, so that's really exciting. Where we're hopeful that over the next few weeks, there'll be lots of central rock rats um, on these cameras. And for those that don't know much about the central rock rats, they're one of Australia's most threatened species. Um, they're actually one of the, the top species that are um, projected to go extinct um, very soon. So, you know, if, if the data shows that we can move some of these animals um, to New Haven and create a new population there, which is part of their former range, Gosh, that'll be so exciting for that species and, and just New Haven and, and just Australia's wildlife story, I think. Um, so that's the next species that we're working on. Um, and also next year, you know, hopefully um, golden bandicoots is a species that we've been talking about for a little while. Um, and there's a few other species as well, Joey. So there's brush-tailed possums, numbats, um, Western quolls, which won't be until a little bit further down the track, and also shark bay mouse. So it's, um, yeah, we're about halfway there and it's, uh, we've sort of started with the easier species, I think, because the other few species are quite challenging. So it's very exciting. Got your work cut out for you. Um, it's, yes. it's so cool because this project, you know, since 2017, um, I was involved when the first fence post was going in and when we were constructing that safe haven. So it's just wonderful to look back now, five years later and see populations absolutely booming good conditions out there at the moment. So things are breeding up. Um, I might come to some of the questions and I am trying to stick to half an hour. So we might just take a couple of questions, but um, someone has asked about populations of the species that have been there for a while. So for the Marla, for example, I know that we do health checks on that population, but are we at the point where we can estimate the total population inside stage one? Almost. Um, so with the, so we actually did a trial uh, stage one wide trapping event, which is a same similar method that we use at like Yukamara and Scotia Wildlife Sanctuary. So Scotia Wildlife Sanctuary is you know four thousand hectares, um, <laughs> and it was very clear from that trial that our densities of marla were still too low to do that sort of stage wide trapping event. I think we caught four individuals over that massive effort. So we've had to sort of hone it back in and do targeted trapping still around certain spots. Um, so we have like a grid based system around, I think we've got six or seven sites. And from there, based on Amala's home range, 
um, we can get a rough estimate, but because we don't really know the Marla home range at, at um, New Haven as yet, we've got an intern that's currently looking at that. Um, it's a little bit hard to estimate a whole population from that type of trapping mm. at the moment, but the trap success we got was good. The females that we trapped, 80, more than 80% of them had females or had some sort of breeding activity going on. The number of individuals caught was um, up from the previous year. So the signs are very good. And with the tracks, um, the track surveys that we do inside the fence, there's evidence of Marla all throughout stage one, which is amazing. And Joey, like when we were out for the release, I saw six Marla in that one night, yeah. you know, adults, females with a big pouch young, a little sub-adult. So just incidentally, they're, they're very much, uh, yeah, all throughout stage, most of stage one. Mm. Um, and hopefully next year with a, another population increase, we can really get a, a firm, robust estimate. Yeah. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Another question here is asking about um, long term. What What are the prospects of doing more than you know the area that we've talked about at stage one? So you know, I guess there's two different parts to it. One is about releases of animals or reintroductions of animals outside of these fenced safe havens. I'll say that we've we've done a bit of work in this area at Mount Gibson Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, and others in the Southwest, actually, at Peruna as well, we do releases there, which is not a, a fully predator-free area. Um, at Mount Gibson, we've got a release coming up, which I believe will be outside the fence. And last year, we released brush-tail possums outside of that fenced area too. So it is an area that we're very interested in, in tandem with intensive feral predator control. It's likely that that won't work for every species, possibly some of the larger, more robust tougher species, toothier species, things like quolls and possums might be able to cop it. Um, but for more vulnerable things, it seems like any level of predation is too much. Helen, what do you think are the prospects for, you know, first doing work beyond stage one at New Haven, but more generally just reintroductions outside of fenced areas? Yeah, I look, the, the good thing about New Haven is that it's such a big property to begin with. So New Haven itself is nearly 270,000 hectares. And now our neighbouring property with the Nalaju partnership takes that whole area to 600,000 hectares. So we've got a really nice area to work with. You know, it's not isolated, it's not small. So I'm really hopeful. I believe we can get some of these species, maybe not all of them, beyond the fence. Bilbies are a fantastic example as well. Um, there's already remnant bilby populations in Australia still. They're very smart. They're solitary. You know, some great research has shown that they can be quite predator savvy. So I've got great hopes for bilbies. I think it's really important that we keep looking at options beyond fences. Um, fences are so important in what we do and a really important tool in our toolbox, but they're certainly not the full stop. Um, so for New Haven, it, it would be amazing to start looking at what's that going, what is that going to look like beyond stage one? I think we're also, it's still very early days with these reintroductions. We can't still yet say if they have been successful or not, that will still be a few years away. Um, so I think what we need to do at New Haven is really learn as much as we can from inside the fence and then adopt what we learn and have that outside and outside the fence or in stage two or whatever we'd like to call it and, and learn from what's happening elsewhere, like at Mount Gibson and Peruna and other places around Australia that are doing similar things. Um, well, that was absolutely fantastic to hear about, Helen. Thank you for sharing with us the story of these recent translocations. We'll have an update on uh, the translocation that's happening this weekend with those bilbies coming from Queensland. So stay tuned. I think Wednesday next week, we'll uh, be talking a bit more about that. Um, for everyone who's tuned in, thank you so much for, for joining us for this uh, webinar, AWC in Conversation. As I mentioned, all of the previous ones are available on our website. So you can type in AWC in Conversation and click through to the, the various episodes that we've had there going back to, um, back to 2020. So lots of different interesting conversations there. Um, also, final um, reminder that end of financial year is the 30th of June. 
we can't do any of this work without your support. And we really appreciate any support that you can give us at this time. Thank you for those of you that have contributed. It makes a real difference for species like the bilby and the burrowing betong, which we've restored to, to Central Australia. So thanks again, Helen. Thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.